The Independence floats in a port off the coast of Lithuania. The ship's name reflects exactly what it's helped the country to become, energy independent. Lithuania's neighbors are also diversifying their energy sources. In today's security environment, there's much more at stake than just cheap, reliable energy. The Independence is a steel giant, the length of three football pitches, nine levels deep, and a place of work for up to 30 staff. This ship can hold over 100 million cubic meters of natural gas, more than meeting Lithuania's natural gas demand since the end of 2014. Before that, the country was reliant on Russia's state-controlled Gazprom. The prices for natural gas that uh, consumers were forced to pay were uh, higher than uh, elsewhere in Europe, although we are even closer to the, to the source of the supplies. Also, over certain periods of time, the security of supplies felt not as secure as, uh, as we wanted. Though Lithuania gained independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, for many years it remained reliant on Russia for oil, gas and electricity. After our independence, oil supplies were stopped to Lithuania, so we realized that we need to, to save also electricity because most of electricity was produced uh, using fuel oil, which was also imported. So we felt, we felt scarcity on gasoline, on electricity, and this uh, made us stronger. In December last year, Lithuania's electricity grid was connected to sites in Poland and Sweden, adding 1,200 megawatts of capacity to the Baltic region via the Litpol cable to Poland and the undersea Nordbalt cable to Sweden. The move furthermore reduced the reliance of the Baltic states on Russia. It connected the countries to the Western European energy market, making energy both cheaper and more secure. We had a history of blackmails of high and very high uh, prices for energy. We saw corrupted politicians in our societies. We saw influence into our uh, statehoodness and, and uh, decision-making processes. So today we can say thank you very much. We're free and we did ourselves. Lithuania's efforts to reduce its dependence on Russia is no exception. Neighboring country Poland opened its own LNG terminal in October 2015. In technical terms, these steps are about enhancing diversification of energy sources. But there is much more at stake. For us, it's not only about economics. For us, first of all, energy security is about politics. It's about enhancement of our transformation from one political system to another. That Nobody could manipulate or abuse dependency um, and, you know, to try to, um, and try to kind of ruin our political system. Because this is not about energy, first of all. This is about political stability, about democracy. And the stronger we are economically, the stronger we are politically. The Baltic Sea plays a key role in ensuring the energy security of the Baltic states but it is also key in enabling collective defense. The port of Klaipeda has lately seen more than LNG shipments. It has seen thousands of troops and equipment deployed onshore for NATO exercises. The Alliance is increasing its readiness to respond swiftly and firmly to security challenges, including by reinforcing the Baltic's defense and deterring potential aggression. Russia has clearly demonstrated its position towards more energy independence um, and stronger defense in the Baltic states. It did it, so, um, it, did it through uh, a number of ways, uh, for example, by disrupting the uh, construction of uh, the Nordbalt um, electricity line uh, between Sweden and Lithuania through conducting military exercises and denying uh, access to the area in the Baltic Sea. In April this year, two Russian Su-24 jets made numerous close-range passes over the USS Donald Cook. The ship was on its way to the Lithuanian port of Klaipeda at the time. Such incidents indicate the importance of the freedom of area access and navigation in the Baltic Sea to energy supplies and military reinforcements alike. And NATO plays a vital role in maintaining that freedom. Over 1,500 kilometers southeast from Klaipeda is Ukraine's Odessa port, which was planned to become a major energy hub with an LNG terminal. 
Further down lies Crimea, with massive onshore and offshore oil and gas resources, which were supposed to bring energy independence to Ukraine. These plans, however, were disrupted in 2014 with the illegal annexation of Crimea. Unlike the Baltic states, Ukraine is not a NATO member and is therefore not covered by NATO's Collective Defense Clause, Article 5 of its founding treaty. But like the Baltics, Ukraine has long suffered energy cutoffs and sudden increases in energy prices, which are part and parcel of Moscow's approach to hybrid war. This kind of war is not only waged by propaganda and the now infamous Little Green Men. Energy, too, is part of that script. The uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis is a clear example of uh, Moscow's ability to integrate energy into a broader set of hybrid tools to achieve its uh, strategic objectives. Uh, Russia has uh, seized Ukraine's oil and gas resources in and around Crimea in the Black Sea. Uh, it has put economic pressure on Ukraine using its uh, energy dependence. It has established a direct uh, gas supply to Donbas <clears throat> to circumvent Kiev in a way. And it has um, demonstrated its capabilities uh, to organize cyber attacks against, against electricity networks. The impact of cyber attacks could be as harmful to modern societies as a conventional attack. Cyber defense is now recognized as part of the Alliance's core task of collective defense. NATO is taking necessary steps to ensure that it is capable of defending itself in cyberspace as in the air, on land, and at sea. Cyber attacks are becoming more common and more sophisticated. Um, in fact, when you look at what is happening, I'd say that most of the uh, crises and conflicts nowadays contain a cyber element. And they are becoming more devastating. Um, uh, infrastructure in particular is a target, and energy infrastructure is a major target. And what I think it shows is that uh, this is more than just about uh, diversifying your suppliers. I'd say that this is about making sure that you have cyber defenses in order to protect your national infrastructure and energy infrastructure in particular. NATO has stated that a cyber attack could trigger Article 5. What this would mean in practice is deliberately left vague, but the message is undoubtedly a strong one. Since Russia started its undeclared war against Ukraine in 2014, energy security in the Baltic region has acquired yet another dimension how to master the energy challenge of deploying major military reinforcements to NATO's easternmost members. NATO's defense strategy is based on an ambitious approach. In a crisis, NATO would quickly send reinforcements to Eastern Europe, including to the Baltic states. But modern militaries require a lot of energy, notably fuel. Will there be enough supplies? And how could they be delivered in light of potential operations that may deny access in the Baltic Sea? This too is now a major concern for NATO. We reviewed our NATO petroleum supply chain in taking into account the new strategic environment. As a result of this review, uh, we prepared a NATO fuel supply chain in support of the Readiness Action Plan, uh, which is based on a four-pillar approach. The first pillar is host nation support, where we use host nation's fuel capabilities. As a second pillar, we're using existing NATO pipeline systems to complement the, the host nation uh, support uh, capabilities. As a third pillar, we are using pre-negotiated commercial contracts in order to ensure access to fuel from commercial sources. And finally, we are using NATO deployable fuel capabilities to receive, store and distribute fuels to NATO forces. To make sure that NATO allies can receive timely reinforcements, it is important that the supporting infrastructure is in place and that it is sufficiently robust. NATO planners speak of a resilient infrastructure. Energy supply is one of several key resilience requirements recently agreed by the Alliance. Security depends on all allies being prepared, not just militarily, but also with civilian planning in the areas such as continuity of government, continuity of vital services to the population, and of course civil support to the military. And energy security, resilient energy supplies, has a very important role to play. This is a very demanding energy security agenda. NATO has had the support of the NATO Center of Excellence for Energy Security in Vilnius since 2012, across the spectrum of its work on related issues. 
Another aspect of energy security that is rapidly gaining interest is how to enhance the energy efficiency in the military. The logistic footprint for energy is very important. Being energy efficient, that means using the technology in order to reduce the need of energy, so to give more autonomy to our troops in operations. The military start to understand and totally change their mind to use now this innovation on energy efficiency to support the, the operation. That there is a value for a capability value using the energy efficiency in operations. On all fronts, energy security is more visible within the work of the Alliance today. This is in no small part due to the Baltic states. Beyond national efforts to secure energy independence, they have worked hard to put it on NATO's agenda. People often believe that at NATO, the smaller uh, countries have less influence than bigger ones. But the story of energy security in NATO actually shows that this is not always true. In fact, the Baltic states, and in particular Lithuania, have done a tremendous job in bringing energy security on the agenda of this alliance. And they have done this with tremendous determination, with tremendous persistence. And the fact that we to today discuss energy security in all its dimensions in this alliance is not least the achievement of the Baltic states. And I believe these countries can be proud of what they have achieved.